thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today on the topic of HIV and higher dose TB treatment. My name is Derek Sloan. I'm a reader in infectious diseases at the University of St Andrews. I suspect much of the audience are already familiar with the problem of TB and HIV co-management, but just some numbers to put that into focus from the most recent WHO Global TB report. There are still almost 10 million people falling ill with TB per year, and about a quarter of a million people dying of TB are also HIV uh, co-infected. 8% of incident TB worldwide occurs in people who are living with HIV, and the rates of that are much higher in some parts of Southern Africa. And perhaps the most crucial point for this talk is clear that HIV treatment success, despite advances, remains lower for people who are also living with HIV, partly due to higher mortality and higher relapse rates in, in, in people who are trying to manage the two diseases at the same time, but also due to polypharmacy, drug-drug interactions and toxicity associated with a higher pill and medication burden of, of co-infection. A brief reminder of what current first-line TB therapy looks like. I'm going to talk predominantly about pulmonary tuberculosis in this brief talk, just to try and maintain some focus, but it's a six-month course of therapy. The first two months contain four drugs, isoniazid, rifampicin, a standard dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram, pirazinamide and ethambutol, and then a four-month continuation phase of the two main drugs, if you like, isoniazid and rifampicin. Isoniazid is important because it's bactericidal and rapidly kills TB cells. Rifampicin is important because it's sterilizing. It kills TB cells that the other drugs can't in a more quiescent metabolic phenotype. And that's important to achieve full sterilization and cure of tuberculosis. Now, we often talk about that six-month course of TB treatment as being short course, but anyone who's had to take that duration of TB therapy realizes it's not short course at all. These images in this table reflect my experience of previously working in KwaZulu-Natal in, in, in South Africa, where getting people through a full course of TB therapy, particularly if they were HIV co-infected, was very difficult. We lost approximately 30% of patients to follow up before the end of treatment, and many of those individuals subsequently died or represented with much harder harder to treat drug-resistant tuberculosis. So a major aim of the field in TB therapeutics is to shorten that duration of first-line TB therapy. A variety of strategies have been proposed in order to help us do that. One of the strategies is increasing the dose of the current first-line TB therapy to see if that makes it more effective. And a lot of the thinking around that strategy centers upon the key sterilizing drug, rifampicin. So rifampicin was developed as an anti-TB drug in the 1950s and started to be used in the 1960s. 60s, and the initial dose was set at 10 milligrams per kilogram once daily. And that dose was set because it was a relatively do low dose that seemed to be more effective than anything that existed already, that was affordable, and that was believed to be safe. That's the dose we continue to use of rifampicin, but some data in recent years has suggested that it might be time to consider changing it. So some mouse studies in the early part of the 21st century showed that the type of exposure associated with 10 milligram per kilogram human dosing was quite low down on a fairly steep dose ex sorry, exposure response curve when it came to killing TB cells in the mouse model. So we would like to be up here, and we're only down here with our current dosing. Moving on to studies in human, led partly by Martin Borey of the Panacea Consortium, but also by other investigators worldwide, a series of maximum tolerated dose studies have been conducted on rifampicin, showing that you can give safely much more than 10 milligrams per kilogram each day, um, and that those higher doses are probably more effective in humans taking us higher up this exposure response curve leading us to ask the question, would higher doses of rifamycin in first-line anti-TB chemotherapy allow shorter treatment and generate better outcomes for patients? A slight caveat that we'll return to in several times during this talk is that some of that work in humans showing that higher dose rifamycin are safe and effective was done in people who were not living with HIV infection. And the evidence is a little bit sparser on the ground for people who are HIV infected, particularly, or HIV positive, I'm sorry, particularly if they're also an anti retroviral therapy. So just to look at some of that evidence in a little bit more detail, the graph on this slide shows a meta-analysis of 365 patients over a number of studies who were giving higher than standard doses of, of rifampicin up towards what we think is the current maximum tolerated dose around 40 milligrams per kilogram. The treatment was well tolerated, 
higher dosing resulted in super proportional increases in exposure, and that higher doses also resulted in higher rates of eight-week sputum culture conversion from positive to negative, indicating that higher dose TB therapy, higher dose rifampicin-based TB therapy may be more effective than standard treatments and might ultimately allow us to shorten the duration of therapy. But in this meta-analysis, only a small proportion of the patients were people who were living with HIV. And so we just have to be a little bit careful about the extrapolation. Rifampicin is no longer the only rifamycin in town for the treatment of tuberculosis. And particularly in US-based studies, there's a lot of interest, or US-led studies, there's a lot of interest in the drug rifapentine, which is a longer half-life than rifampicin and is possibly more potent which also has an exposure response relationship, where also we think that higher than standard doses may be beneficial. So doses of 1200 milligrams per day, that's double the initially used dose or higher may be beneficial, particularly for people in higher risk populations. And we know that HIV is a significant predictor of lower rifapentine exposure. But again, some of the analysis showing that higher dose rifapentine is effective in in first-line TB therapy were predominantly conducted in populations with lower numbers of people living with HIV. The work that's been done in rifampicin and rifapentine so far has sort of coalesced into this trial study 31 that was published last year, in which standard six-month-long anti-TB chemotherapy was compared to two alternative regimens, and I'll draw particular attention to this one, where the dose of rifapentine was given high 1,200 milligrams per day, double the standard dose, and where moxifloxacin was in introduced instead of the standard first-line drug, methambutol. And very briefly, this regimen here achieved successful cure without post-treatment relapse in sufficient patients to be declared non-inferior to standard therapy. So optimizing and increasing the dose of TB treatment drugs did allow shorter therapy, and that's the first time that we've ever identified that in a clinical trial. However, a little bit of a caveat, HIV positive patients were recruited to the trial, but only 8% of participants in the trial were people living with HIV, and there were some restrictions on antiretroviral therapy regimens allowed to be used and CD4 count thresholds for recruitment. So the power in an HIV positive population was somewhat limited, but nevertheless, benefit was displayed. Additional trials are also ongoing, looking at higher dose TB therapy, particularly higher dose rifamycin on TB treatment outcomes. A brief re a reference to these two, which are either going to publish or going to take place soon. The RIFA-SHORT study using high dose rifampicin but excluded HIV populations, and the STEP 2C study run by the Panacea Consortium, which will look at high dose rifampicin alongside high dose pyrazinamide and introduction of moxifloxacin, and does allow recruitment of HIV populations, but with some caveats again around CD4 count and ART regimen. And this study, which I am allowed, which I am uh, leading alongside Professor Stellan Pagama at Kibongoto Infectious Diseases Hospital in Tanzania, a multi-center study which will look at high those rifampicin and moxifloxacin based TB treatment and which does not have restrictions on HIV status, CD4 count and participation and which allows a broader range of antiretroviral regimens including both volutegravir and defavirenz. So more data should emerge on HIV populations on high dose TB therapy. The data so far is encouraging but, um, but, but smaller numbers of HIV uh, positive patients in the trials. Something that people often ask about when we postulate the idea of higher dose TB drugs, particularly rifamycin for HIV patients, is the risk of drug-drug interactions. We know that rifamycin are potent cytochrome P450 inducers. We know that can affect the plasma concentrations of efavirenz and dolutegravir, and we worry that if we further increase the dose of rifamycin, we'll exacerbate that problem. Dr. Christine Sakaja wiltshire conducted a study in Uganda to look specifically at that drug-drug interaction issue, giving patients high or standard dose of rifampicin alongside either efavirenz and dolutegravir based ART. And I'll show some of those recently published results in the next few slides. Firstly, Christine showed that if you give higher dose rifampicin, it does somewhat reduce the plasma concentrations measured of first-line antiretroviral therapy, whether you're using efavirenz or dolutegravir. However, thresholds for probable efficacy um, were met irrespective of the rifampicin dose that was given. And we did not show in either treatment arm uh, an effect of higher dose rifampicin and HIV viral load suppression. Patients remained suppressed in regard to, to their HIV viral load, irrespective of what rifampicin uh, concentration we gave to them.
We also showed, and I think this is the first time it was shown in an entirely HIV positive population, that there is much faster eight weeks sputum culture conversion in patients who are higher compared to standard dose rifampicin. And we also showed the increase increasing the rifampicin dose in an entirely HIV positive population, some of whom are profoundly immunosuppressed, all of whom are also in antiretroviral therapy, was as safe as giving standard rifampicin. There was no increase in the rates of adverse events. And although there were a few deaths in the high growth rifampicin arm, careful analysis of those indicated that none of them were attributable to the study drugs. So what did the SafeRef study tell us in that regard? Well, it was cautiously reassuring on drug-drug interactions. There was some effect on the pharmacokinetic measurement of, of, of antiretroviral drugs in the plasma, but it didn't seem to affect HIV control. And the drugs were certainly effective and safe when the rifampicin was given at higher dose for the management of tuberculosis. And so we think that this justifies further study of high-dose rifamycins in TBHIV patients. It probably justifies use of high-dose rifamycin in TBHIV patients. And certainly this population should be included in further clinical trials of that strategy. There are some ongoing questions, I think. Did those reductions in plasma ART exposure matter? We do need to study that a little bit more in larger populations, and we intend to do so. So final things to think about towards the end of this talk, is higher dosing of existing TB drugs the only way forward to improve TB therapy? And the answer is probably not. There are new drugs such as bedaquiline and pretominid and, and TB treatment regimens based on those are, are also in clinical trials that are reported later this year. And non-rifamycin-based TB treatments are less likely to have any drug-drug interactions with HIV medications, which may be an advantage. I've talked exclusively in this talk about dose optimization of rifampicin and rifapentine. There are some studies looking at higher doses of other first-line anti-TB medications, and I haven't discussed them in the course of this talk, and nor have I talked about the role of higher dose rifamycin in the treatment of latent TB infection, and there are some studies internationally planned or ongoing on those things too. Finally, then, will this solution of increasing the dose of first-line TB drugs shorten and improve TB treatment? I think it will be part of the answer, but I think more evidence is required for HIV populations, given the small um, representation of that population in some of the existing trials. And I do think we will need additional alternative options for some HIV-positive patients, for example, those who have drug-drug interactions or are intolerant of the rifamycins. And I think that we're, when we are conducting drug-drug interaction studies for patients with TB and HIV, we have to think carefully about what really matters. Does the plasma measurement of the antiretroviral drug matter, or is it the effect on HIV viral load suppression? And we need to design our studies around appropriate endpoints. And we also need to consider, based on the SafeRef data, for example, whether we would accept a trade-off between a modest drug-drug interaction with a pharmacokinetic effect of high-dose TB drugs on HIV medications, provided that also brought about better TB treatment efficacy and led us towards shorter therapies. We may need to decide what is most important for the overall care of our patients. I don't have time to acknowledge everyone who is involved in the work presented in this slide, but I will thank all of the patients, researchers and funders involved, and I particularly pay thanks to those who I work with in some of the studies presented in the data of this talk. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.